Arabu Kumirai Ozi, Chairperson of the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, Mrs. Margaret Sangare, Deputy Commissioner General, M. Crime, M. E. Ngirande, Representative of the Commissioner General of Prisons, Mr. Willy Resiro, Assistant Commissioner ZRP, Mr. S. Ndovu, Registrar of the Constitutional Court, Mr. E. Makomo, the representative of the U.S. Ambassador, Keynes Jennifer Pence, the invited guest of honor, Dr. Justice Navanathan Play, Anti-Corruption Commission, Commissioner Jesse Majome, members of the academia present, the Vice President of the Law Society of Zimbabwe, uh, Mr. Tatenda Mawere, the Law Society councillors, the Walter Kamba family members and trustees, past president of the Law Society, past president Motkai Matlang, past president of the Law Society of Zimbabwe, past president Mbai Nyemba, past president of the Law Society of Zimbabwe, past president uh, Mishek uh, Okwe, Past recipients of the Walter Kamba Rule of Law Award, Executive Directors of Civil Society Organizations, Senior and Junior Members of the Legal Profession, Representatives of the Media Houses, Mr. Edward Mapara, the Secretary of the Law Society of Zimbabwe. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular Honor to welcome you all to the 2019 Walter Kamba Rule of Law Lecture. Twelve years ago, the Law Society of Zimbabwe made a deliberate decision to set aside a day each year to celebrate the life and deeds of one of our iconic scholars and legal educator, Professor Walter Joseph Kamba. The Walter Kamba Rule of Law Lecture not only provides us with an opportunity to remind ourselves of his great achievements through the lecture, but also to introspect both as a profession and as a nation on matters of our commitment to the, observance, to the observance of the rule of law and good governance. The Law Society of Zimbabwe firmly believes that the observation of the rule of law and good governance is a prerequisite for progress, nation building, the eradication of poverty, and economic emancipation and development. Without the observance of the rule of law, both the governed and the governing will together perish as fools. This lecture comes at a time when our country has been plagued by a number of challenges in the past two or so years. The social, political, and economic conditions have continued to be a source of anxiety and concern. There is no denying that uh, the violence and subsequent disturbances post the 2018 harmonized elections left a scar on the soul of our nation. Our commitment to the observance of the rule of law and respect for human rights as a nation was put to test. Lives and property were needlessly lost in circumstances where the rule of law and respect for human rights was seemingly compromised. In January 2019, our country experienced widespread protests which in turn invited fast-track criminal trials following dreadnet arrests of protesters and sometimes those who happened to be in the vicinity. These incidences and others put to the test our institutional commitment to the observance of the rule of law and respect for human rights as a nation. The Law Society of Zimbabwe issued four statements in 2019 alone all of which were in one way or another 
concerned with the observance of the rule of law and respect for human rights. The executive was exhorted to respect the rule of law and human rights. Our commitment saw us engaging the judiciary, the executive in the form of the police, the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, amongst other stakeholders. We undertake that we shall continue as a profession to, and to engage all stakeholders for the betterment of our nation and of our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to announce that together with our partners, we will this year be rolling out training programs for the Prosecutor General's officers as well as the Legal Aid Directorate staff with a bias towards the respect for human rights and issues of adherence to principles of constitutionalism. In the past, we have conducted the trainings of magistrates in similar areas. We recently signed a memorandum of understanding with Parliament, and it is hoped that, as in the past, our technical assistance will go a long way in pushing forward the alignment of laws program. As we celebrate the life and deeds of Walter Joseph Kamba, we are cognizant of the highlights of his career, which began with attending the University of Cape Town, where he obtained both a Bachelor of Arts degree and a Bachelor of Law degree. A Master's degree at the United States Yale Law School was to follow. In 1967, Professor Kamba was appointed at, as a research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London before he proceeded to Scotland to the University of Dundee, first as a lecturer in comparative, in comparative uh, law and uh, jurisprudence and ultimately as dean of the faculty of law and university orator. The University of Dundee was to recognize his outstanding contribution by awarding him the degree of Doctor of Laws in 1982. At the same time, our hero provided legal assistance to nationalist movements fighting for the independence of this country and subsequently attended the Lancaster House negotiations towards majority rule. He was proud to have participated in the processes of negotiations, but he was selfless enough not to justly for any political position when the liberators came back home. His outstanding dedication to this cause was to be recognized by the National University of Lesotho when it awarded him the 15th Anniversary Distinguished Service Award Court in appreciation and in recognition of, of Professor Kamba's leadership role and for the outstanding contribution made towards education in Africa, unquote. At independence in 1980, Professor Kamba was appointed the first black vice chancellor of the University of Zimbabwe, where he immediately set about to deconstruct the structures of colonialism at the country's foremost institution of higher learning. He left the University of Zimbabwe in 1980 following the passing of the uh, UZ Amendment Act 1990. Most of you would know about the circumstances. Today, ladies and gentlemen, the Law Society of Zimbabwe will, in addition to listening to the lecture, honor those of our members who have excelled in the field of promotion of the rule of law and respect for human rights. We are encouraged that there is still amongst us those who seek to emulate our late hero and have equal determination to contribute to our, to our society. The Walter Kamba Rule of Law Award is the most prestigious award given by the Law Society of Zimbabwe. Nominees are drawn from legal practitioners who would have demonstrated a commitment to the promotion of the study of law and the possible beyond. The would be recipient must have must be a person of high standing in society with high moral standards 
and mass in addition have immediately, sorry, immensely and constantly contributed towards the independence of the legal profession and independence of the judiciary. They must have been outstanding in exhibiting consistent support and promotion of the rule of law, liberty, truth, and justice. Must have demonstrated work of continued courage, dedication, and commitment towards upholding the rule of law. And lastly, you must have unquestionable morals and have no previous uh, convictions. Tonight's second award would be an award to the Young Human Rights Lawyer of the Year Award. This award is based on the assessment of the work of the young lawyers for a particular year. And this is an award that is sponsored by our sponsors, Scanlan and Wilderness. The award is given to an outstanding young human rights lawyer who would have tenaciously fought for human rights in defense of the victims, even in the face of uh, opposition or danger to their person. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let me take this opportunity to thank you, and I invite you to sit back, relax, enjoy the lecture and the subsequent proceedings. I thank you, Master of Ceremony. Thank you. Interesting very highlights from uh, that speech. And uh, looking forward to be seeing our recipients. I think you've read the criteria, and you must be a person of unquestionable morality. That's very important. Unquestionable. Are you with me? Meaning they shouldn't be entertaining any form of question with a slight moderate or medium. It has to be unquestionable. And you must not have any previous conviction other than your conviction that human rights are right. So at this juncture, allow me to invite uh, our executive secretary to just give us some remarks so that we can all... I was looking at the program and I was supposed to precede the president. And uh, after allowing the president to speak ahead of me, there is very little that I am able to say without uh, seeking to outdo what the president has already done. But ladies and gentlemen, it is important that uh, we have heroes and we celebrate our heroes. And tonight, it is my duty to celebrate you ahead of the, our deeds that we are going to have today. You are heroes because you have uh, heeded the call by the Law Society to come and be with us and celebrate the foremost heroes that are going to be awarded and the departed in whose name we are gathered today. Uh, I want to thank you all for having left your homes on a particularly good Friday like this, to be with us and uh, undertake this event, which, as the President has already explained, is a very critical event and the flagship event of the Law Society, the foremost and biggest prize that the Law Society can award. So we are quite uh, thrilled that today uh, we have a full house of members who are celebrating with us. I want to particularly acknowledge our previous, our Ds, who continue to cherish uh, the good works of our hero, Walter Kamba, and continue to also uh, cherish the work of the Law Society by uh, gracing this event. So I want to welcome you all, and as the President has already said, I wish you a pleasant evening, wish you to sit, relax, and uh, absorb the wise words that we expect to receive today uh, from the lecture that we are going to have. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I will once again say welcome, sit back, relax, and we hope we will network after all is, uh, is done. And Thank you so much. Um, some years ago at summer school, something of this sort happened. I want to tell people what happened. 
but know that it was intentional. It was unintentional. At this particular moment in time, my shoes are small. I can't introduce the next uh, person, but at this stage, allow me to invite once again um, our president to invite to us and introduce the guest of honor today. Master of Ceremony, thank you very much. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, honored tonight uh, to introduce to you our guest of honor. I have with me several pages, and you will be patient as I go through these pages, and it goes to exhibit uh, the kind of person that we have before us. We are indeed honored uh, to have here tonight. Our guest of honor is Justice Navanathem, also known as Navi Pillay, who is a South African jurist born on the 23rd of September 1941. She served as the United Nations High Commission Commissioner for Human Rights from 2008 to 2014. She is a South African of Indian Tamil origin. She was uh, the first non-white woman judge of the High Court of South Africa. And she was also, she has also served as a judge of the International Criminal Court and President of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. On the 24th of July 2008, the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon nominated her for, for a year term as the High Commissioner for Human Rights beginning on the 1st of September 2008 and was extended an additional two years in 2012. In April 2015, Justice Pillay became the 16th Commissioner of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty. Before then, in 1967, Pillay became the first non-white woman to open her own law firm in Natal province. As a non-white lawyer under the apartheid regime, she was not allowed to enter a judge's chambers. During her 28 years as a lawyer in South Africa, she defended, she defended anti-apartheid activists and helped expose the use of torture and poor conditions of political detainees. You know, when you're as old as me, there's a, there's a lot that has happened in the past. Um, I'm very pleased to be here because uh, had it not been for a colonial border, actually we in the same country. Um, so everything I see in Zimbabwe is very much what we are going through in my own country as well. Uh, I'm deeply honored to deliver the 2019 Walter Kamba Human Rights Lecture uh, at the invitation of the Law Society of Zimbabwe. Professor Kamba is indeed a towering figure for all uh, to emulate. Many, I, I, before I came, I spoke to a number of South African academics who met him, and he seemed to have traveled a lot in South Africa to various universities, and they had very high regard for him. He was highly educated. In law, he held an LLB from the University of Cape Town and an LLM from Yale University in the USA. He served in many positions with great integrity, and at the height of his career, he took the principled position of stepping down as Vice Chancellor of the University of Zimbabwe, rather than tolerate political interference in academic freedom. So he sacrificed his career, but not his principles, and lived his life accordingly. 
I respect the trustees of the Walter Joseph Kamba Trust for maintaining his legacy by the promotion of peace, human rights, democracy, and good governance. I have a great pleasure in congratulating this year's recipient of the Rule of Law Award. It's highly commendable that the Law Society of Zimbabwe holds this annual event as a demonstration of its strong support for the rule of law and independence of the judicial and legal profession. As a lawyer and judge myself uh, for over 50 years, it is a particularly particular pleasure for me to join colleagues in the legal profession. This is not my first visit to the uh, Law Society of Zimbabwe. I was also here on an official visit as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2012 and again for the Rule of Law Conference hosted by the African Bar Association and the Law Society of Zimbabwe. I thought that in my address I'd look at some of the global issues and then look at the national issues. In every part of the world, lawyers are a powerful voice for social change and for upholding the rule of law. People look up to you for your expertise in the law. Thank you. People look up to you for your critical minds and your educating role. The sad fact, however, is that the public are disenchanted with the role that some lawyers are playing. And this is the debate, public debate on TV and radio just this week in South Africa. And the public are asking, surely there are ethical considerations that should bind lawyers not to help corrupt clients who steal from the public, hide the loot, and avoid prosecution, especially where the lawyers know the true facts or must reasonably suspect the guilt of their clients? Do they knowingly take the fruits of crime as their fees? Where do we draw the line that makes us complicit? Lawyers tend to shield themselves, as I did myself, with cliched responses such as, everyone is presumed innocent, everyone has a right to a legal defense, so I will defend whoever instructs me. And we also use the attorney-client privilege to say why we can't disclose what goes on. But you need to know that this is a raging debate in South Africa and may well end with the government responding and regulating the lawyers. Now, we don't want that, so do think of self-regulation in terms of ethics. In the context of allegations of mass corruption, theft of taxpayers' assets by powerful men and women, and illicit flow of funds out of our continent, people are questioning whether lawyers should not be more accountable. And this is evident in public discussions, as I said, right now in my country, but also elsewhere. So let me give a USA example for you in the context of the exposure of gender violence and child pornography people express their disgust with lawyers who defended the billionaire pedophile jeffrey epstein intimidated the child victims and secured a deal of early release uh, for mr epstein and then you know after three years he he then repeated the offense on many other children it's quite a scandal because his friends are the Queen's son and Bill Clinton and so on. Uh, so what a single lawyer does reflects on the profession as a whole. So we need to be concerned over whether we see human rights and ethics as relevant and as intrinsic to our professional work so that the perception of mistrust on the part of the public is dispelled. 
and one of the best ways in my view in which we can honor the legacy of Walter Kamba is for lawyers to become active partners, not outsiders, but identifying with the people in their struggle for peace, democracy, human rights, and good governance. And one of the ways in which we can do that is for lawyers to undertake pro bono work or engage in human rights or public interest litigation in the course of their regular practice. Uh, lawyers are doing that in my country, but there are too many cases and victories for me to recount. One, you will recall, done by the public interest lawyers and joined by the Law Society of South Africa, was the case where the South African Constitutional Court ruled that Zuma's uh, suspension of the uh, tribunal, the Saudic Human Rights Tribunal, was invalid. Now, you know how that arose. There was a complaint from the former head of this country about Sardik ruling against him. So the, the, all the leaders who met at that summit just closed down the tribunal. I was high commissioner then, and those judges came to see me. I constantly intervened with the Sardik summit, but they just wouldn't see me. I'll just give you that as an example of litigation that lawyers can undertake. Now, the rule of law that you have chosen as the premise of the annual awards is a fundamental tenet of the Zimbabwean and the South African constitutions. Rule of law means laws that are fully compliant with internationally accepted norms and standards. Rule of law does not mean rule by law or rule of force. So, for instance, pre-independence law in Zimbabwe and apartheid law in South Africa were not in compliance with international, internationally accepted standards because they were oppressive and discriminatory. Actually, growing up during the dark years of apartheid, practicing as a lawyer at that time, I longed for a system of law based on standards, on values, and on human rights. A law that would be very clear on what is right and what is wrong. The uh, rule of law was the subject of a United Nations declaration on September 24, 2012, signed by all heads of state, including the Zimbabwe's head of state at that time. This declaration of the United Nations stressed that human rights and the rule of law are indispensable foundations for a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world and emphasized the interlinked and mutually reinforcing nature of human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. So I'm quoting from the document adopted by states. But when we look around the world, events around the world, the ongoing conflicts provide stark reminders to us of how the absence of the rule of law can lead to massive loss of lives. It can lead to forced displacement and refugee flows and violations of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Tragic conflicts in the Syrian Arab Republic now in its 10th year, causing untold suffering of millions of people. Conflicts in Burundi, South Sudan, Burkina Faso, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Sri Lanka, and occupied Palestine. All, all of these demonstrate the essential need for the U United Nations and the African Union to engage to strengthen the effective protection of human rights and the rule of law. <coughs> Democratic societies founded on the rule of law and strong, independent, accountable institutions, as well as transparent and inclusive decision-making processes are more likely to provide effective protection of human rights and to avert eruptions of conflict. 
Impunity from justice and accountability allows gross human rights violations to thrive. It undermines the fabric of societies and prevents the development of peace and reconciliation. It makes a mockery of the rule of law. Establishing and maintaining effective mechanisms to ensure accountability for crimes and violations, corruption and bad governments are key steps for the preservation or restoration of the rule of law in the aftermath of conflict or authoritarian rule. This is why the world favors so much international criminal accountability and under these new courts. I mean, they were no more than 30 years ago. We had nothing. Then we had the ad hoc tribunals for, for Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia and Rwanda and the International Criminal Court and many more uh, judicial mechanisms. So it's a new development, but here on our continent, it filled a great need for accountability. Uh, of grave crimes committed by people in leadership positions. I want to move now to explain what is human rights, because when I was High Commissioner, you will be shocked to learn how the words were hardly not mentioned in big halls, not mentioned in documents, or even treated as some kind of dirty words. Don't bring it into this room. Um, you know, the ambassador said to me that, um, it's because you are, a you are a judge that you're a good high commissioner because you listen to both sides of the story. I mean, this is great coming from representatives of the state as well. But, but what do judges do? We look at the law and we say to the people who drew them, you have to implement your law or you're breaking your own laws in this and that way. So when I became high commissioner for human rights in 2008, I learned that when my predecessor, she was also a judge, Judge Louise Arbor from Canada, and she tried to address the Security Council. And they asked her to leave because they said that is not a place for human rights. And you know who said that to her? The South African ambassador, Kumalo of Democratic South Africa. But so when I became High Commissioner, I get a call from Ambassador Kumalo who said, you know, the Security Council is holding a retreat for its new members, and they would like you to come and address them, and, and it will be a real good thing if you do that. And of course, I went and addressed them, and some of the other states said, uh, you know, they were surprised and pleased that I was putting forth a position opposite to my own gov government. And why was I doing that? I looked, I looked as a lawyer and a judge, I looked at the mandate of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I have to look after all rights of all people all over the world, promote and protect them, right? The Universal Declaration didn't say these rights are for all, except black people, except women, except LGBTI crowd or persons with disabilities. And I figured, how can the Security Council deliver on its supreme mandate of peace and security all over the world without being briefed on the human rights situation? So I uh, asked the Secretary General, uh, I said to the Secretary General, I want to go address the Security Council. And he said, you know, I took Louise Arbor in, what can I do? I had her sitting behind me, but they asked her to leave. Um, so, to cut a long story short, I addressed them more than 15 times. Um, so, this is what lawyers and judges do. You know, we don't give up. We keep pushing and reminding people, which I did to the Security Council. I said, uh, human rights violations are an alert to conflicts brewing. So, you need to know before that, instead of always reacting to a situation. So I understand they went right back to the, uh, to the position of excluding human rights from the Security Council after I left, because they wouldn't allow my successor, Prince Zaid, to address the Security Council. 
how oh, well it's a story in this country and my country as well. You win and then you get a pushback, you start fighting all over again. So anyway, that's a long introduction to why I felt I should explain what is human rights. Firstly, there is no doubt that the ravages of colonialism, neo-colonialism and apartheid, left African countries deeply impoverished. Wealth continues to, to remain in the hands of the few, the whites. Inequalities and poverty became entrenched and the gap between rich and poor, between developed countries and developing or underdeveloped countries is increasing. When I uh, became High Commissioner for Human Rights, I came from a developing country. I knew the priorities of people in Africa. And at this office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, I found that there was a skewed emphasis on civil and political rights. That's what the donors from northern countries would pay for. Um, and, and so I tried to correct that. The president mentioned that I'd made a statement about Quebec, because there they were passing a law suppressing protests of the students. When I raised that in the Human Rights Council, the Canadian ambassador was furious. So was the German ambassador in another incident. And they said to me, you know, your job is not to focus on our countries, but all these faraway places where there are killing thousands of people. So they hated to look in their backyard and part of the answer is they were afraid of a call by all poor people for economic and social rights. So let me begin by making one important point. Although for historical reasons, there are two distinct United Nations conven covenants, one on civil and political rights, ICCPR, and Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, I-C-E-S-C-R. There is only one set of human rights, as originally outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and as outlined in the African Charter for Human Rights. All human rights are universal, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. No one human right can be achieved fully without the enjoyment of other rights. The right to vote or to assemble freely is important, but it does not mean too much to someone with a hungry stomach, with no decent work, or who is sick and unable to access health care. At the same time, as the noted Nobel laureate Amartya Sen has said, I quote, no famine has ever occurred in a functioning democracy. Full and active participation of civil society in governance may lead to appropriate policies. Likewise, access to information, including a free media and respect for dissent and criticism may enable people to participate in democracy better and to exercise their vote better. All subscribe, all states subscribe to this right to dignity. Oh, sorry, except the United States. They don't have it in their constitution. The human rights of freedom of speech and assembly, the right to make decisions affecting one's life and to move freely to seek opportunities are essential for the life of dignity. Likewise, human experience demonstrates that the long-term investment of capital, access to credit, and the development of property rights, which are all necessary for economic growth and development, and for the realization of economic, social, and cultural rights, are challenged under repression or under bad governance. One of the uh, most important documents agreed to in recent times, you will know, at the UN is the adoption of sustainable development goals called Agenda 2030. 
And you will recall that the previously the document that preceded Agenda 2030 was the Millennium Development Goals, where the states made sure that these two bad words do not appear in that document, human rights. Um, and that Millennium Development Goals was also opposed to the notion of rights for all. Instead, they set targets. They'll save uh, 100,000 people from maternal mortality. Don't know what's going to happen to the, the rest of the people. That kind of thing. They set targets. So now, Agenda 2030 has the goal, leave no one behind. So that's, and, and it has human rights mentioned in eight places. I can't tell you how hard we worked to persuade states, put all that language in. So do look at Agenda 2030. It goes to a new level on development and human rights. And the notion that leave no, no one behind is very important in, in, in determining policy, economic policy, how the budget is devised and so on by governments. You can't leave anyone behind. I would say that after a long struggle, the UN accepts that you cannot have peace and justice without development, and you cannot have any of those three without human rights. So you may ask, uh, do states have any obligations in terms of these uh, human rights instruments? What are the obligations of states? States have the obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. This means states are required to adopt appropriate measures to fully realize human rights. For instance, addressing the land and housing needs of the population generally requires a national strategy. Designed with the participation of rights holders, people are the rights holders, Governments are the duty bearers. Uh, so designed with the participation of rights holders, such a strategy would prioritize the needs of the most vulnerable and would spell out clear objectives and dates for implementation. Now, the activities of business can also have a profound impact on the en enjoyment of human rights. While business can contribute to the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights by investment in industry, by creating jobs, and engendering revenue, human rights law requires states to protect against human rights abuses by business enterprises, by taking steps to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress such abuse. And for their part, business enterprises have a responsibility to respect human rights wherever they operate, which means that they must exercise due diligence to ensure that they do not infringe on human rights and address any and cause any adverse impacts. So there is the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which was endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council, but it's not a binding document. So there I would say to you, well, states and businesses don't have obligations, but you'll be surprised the number of major industries who have signed up to that document because they want the perception that they're complying with human rights standards. How do our governments respond to all these obligations? They will tell you straight that there's lack of resources, especially in poor countries. So let me address the resource dimension of economic, social, and cultural rights. In many parts of the world, including my country and yours, governments say that a lack of resources inhibits them from delivering economic, social, and cultural rights. So why not? acknowledge this reality, I want to emphasize that respecting and protecting human rights do not necessarily require substantial financial resources all the time. These obligations mainly require states to refrain from violating human rights. 
They require states to protect the population against possible violations. Many facets of economic, social, and cultural rights actually depend on the adoption of the right policies and the necessary laws and the willingness to implement them free of corruption, rather than simply looking for funds or other resources. However, of course, some economic, social, and cultural rights obligations do necessitate financial resources, do require time to be fully implemented. For example, building in infrastructure to provide clean drinking water for each household, or providing local health, cl health clinics to reduce maternal and child mortality rate, all of these require investment of funds and time. So does this mean that states can postpone the implementation of the obligation to fulfill human rights? The answer is no. States need to take immediate measures. Here I'm quoting both international law and the African Union uh, documents. States need to take immediate measures. Oh, and I'm also quoting my constitution. I'm not familiar with yours. States need to take immediate measures using the maximum available resources at their disposal for the progressive realization of rights. These resources can be both national and they can be international. Moreover, measures that states take need to be efficient and need to be concrete, and they should prioritize those most in need with clear indicators of progress and timelines for their achievements. Consultation, participation, free prior and informed consent of communities on issues such as land or non-discrimination, the need for transparency, accountability, and the rule of law are all key factors for the implementation of human rights generally and economic, social, and cultural rights in particular. I led a mission here in May 2012. You know, I checked up to find when, when was I in Zimbabwe. Everything seems so long ago. Uh, so I came in here as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights at the invitation of the Mugabe government. I was a bit surprised, of course, because it wouldn't let, they wouldn't let, you know, Jimmy Carter, the former president of the United States, told me he came right up to the airport here and they wouldn't let him in. He was one of the elders. He, Mary Robinson, Archbishop Tutu, and so on. So I was surprised when they asked me to come in. I did. Uh, and of course, I documented large-scale human rights violations, with mainly uh, uh, killings and, uh, and injuries upon um, um, voters during the election by the military. But I also noted that sanctions imposed by some Western governments on named individuals in Zimbabwe were having a harmful impact on the people of Zimbabwe. So that's a very important role of the high commission, a uh, high commissioner. You have to be balanced, as judges are. It's lawyers who take sides, you know, judges tend to be balanced, look at both sides. <laughs> you listen to one lawyer, you get swayed by his argument, you listen to the other one, yeah. Tough job to be a judge. So I, um, how did I arrive at this conclusion that the sanctions then in 2012 affected ordinary people? I can't tell you how many urgent, whispered communications came to me not to go there. Please don't look into sanctions. All right, so uh, I did that because, among other reasons, according to the Zimbabwe Demographic Health Survey of 2011, which I secured at that time, the maternal mortality rate had increased by 40% in just six years, from 555 deaths in every 100,000 in 2005 to 960 per 100,000. And as I spoke to the uh, women here, they told me about the difficulty there were no roads, no ambulances to get to the hospital, 
and there were no equipment at the hospital in, in any case, and they had to pay for treatment at the hospital. So rather than go to the hospital to have their babies delivered, there were home deliveries, and that's why this increase um, in maternal mortality. You know, I should tell you that after that statement of mine, European governments suspended the sanctions. I met with President Mugabe at the UN in a subsequent meeting, and he complained to me, yes, but they only suspended it. They should have lifted the sanctions. So, of course, it was a good opportunity for me to tell him, yeah, you need to do a one, two, three here for them to lift the sanctions. Which brings me to... Uh, the situation of human rights in Zimbabwe today. And I want to say that I'm very, very mindful that this is your lived experience here. You know, the last thing you want is for an outsider to come in, lecture you on this, and spoil your dinner. <laughs> but this is a human rights lecture, and it'll be... Uh, hypocritical if I do not address the situation right here. I was originally invited by the um, Law Society of Zimbabwe to deliver the Walter Kamba lecture in January last year. And I'm thinking now what a different lecture one delivers and that in just one year, the year 2019, the human rights environment has deteriorated to such an extent that it is heartbreaking for me, and I'm sure for Walter Kamba, had he been alive, to see so much suffering, and to have the hopes of Zimbabweans for a better future under a change of government dashed. In almost every facet of life, deterioration of civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights has reached crisis proportions. You have a good constitution, a good Bill of Rights, like South Africa. Zimbabwe has ratified the African Union Charter of Human and People's Rights and the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And yet the country faces mammoth challenges with implementation of rights. So. I do not have too much time, so I'm just going to review what I see as some of the failures. Now, in social economic rights that I was stressing, uh, of course, you know, the chronic shortages of physical cash, the spiraling cost of food, itself a scarce commodity, fuel shortages, inflation at 300%, and unemployment, further aggravated by austerity measures and natural disasters, have caused a crisis of poverty and insecurity in this country. Now, on the right to health, the right of patients to access health is severely hampered by shortages of medicines, inadequate equipment, life-saving machines, inadequate nursing staff, burdensome hospital charges, and poorly paid medical personnel. While doctors have gone on peaceful protests and strikes over the untenable conditions, it is the patients who ultimately pay the price of the neglect with their lives. The statistics disclosed by the maternal unit management at Harare Central Hospital to the effect that an average of 75 babies die every month at that hospital alone. Now, this should shock our conscience. What are we doing to our future? On the right to food, the UN World Food Program indicated that one third of the 16 million population of Zimbabwe are now in dire need of food and face starvation. The right to water, well, you know all about this. I followed that the cities of Bulawayo and Harare were hit by water shortages. And in 2019, a 48-hour water shedding in Bulawayo and a total shutdown of water supplies in Harare on September 23rd. Local councils are waging a losing battle to fix breakdowns because of, among other, re among other reasons, lack of access to foreign currency 
currency to import purifying chemicals. Now, there is huge discontent over the right to land and adequate housing. The same in my country. In fact, the youth marching the streets accuse President Mandela of betraying us, betraying the youth by not addressing the land question, by not getting the land back from those who stole the land from them, to quote the students. So it's a very, very hot issue. So what do we mean by right to land and adequate housing? Security of tenure and affordability are the two key elements of the right to adequate housing. Zimbabwe actually played an active role in the adoption by the Food and Agricultural Organization of guidelines on how to access land that incorporates a human rights approach. Many of you are looking surprised. Yeah, I think you're very good at writing these wonderful policies and surprised that you don't see any evidence of implementation. Everyone should possess a degree of security of tenure which guarantees legal protection against forced eviction, against harassment and other threats. Affordability means the cost of rent or mortgage should not be so high that the family has no money for food and medicines. In many places in the world, not only in Zimbabwe, people have no official title to land and housing. They live in so-called informal settlements. Informal settlements are primarily the result of rural urban migration because of the lack of access to basic services and income generating activities in rural areas or because of poverty, homelessness, landlessness, lack of affordable housing or forcible displacement conflicts cause forcible displacement. Bad governments cause forced displacement. I can't tell you how much we're benefiting from the intelligence and good work of Zimbabweans who are serving us in South Africa when they'd prefer to be here rendering their service. It is unfortunate that in many places, including here in Zimbabwe, the response to what is essentially a poverty issue has been forced, has been forced evictions of those living in informal settlements rather than a more human rights sensitive approach. Now, numerous studies show us that forced evictions do not resolve the issue of informal settlements. People need to have access to jobs and will therefore have no choice but to return and to set up new shelters, perpetuating the cycle of evictions. Evictions cause further destitution and poverty. Evictions are costly and they cause much suffering. If evictions should not occur at all unless adequate alternate accommodation is available. Our courts have said so. I turn now to civil and political rights in Zimbabwe. Give me a second, lost my page. Now, Zimbabwe is a party, as I said, to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the, the Constitution, especially in Article 58, guarantees the right of freedom of assembly and association. Yet the security forces reportedly used live firearms to forcibly put down civilian protests against the 130% increase in fuel prices in January last year, in which 16 civilians were killed, 600 persons arrested in August, September, and all part of a widespread crackdown against protests. Now, on the 18th January 2019, the present High Commissioner for Human Rights, who is the former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, issued a press statement expressing concern <coughs> over reports of excessive use of force by law, 
by law enforcement. Here, in the aftermath of the protests, security forces, mostly military, oh, I'm quoting a statement, in the aftermath of the protests, security forces, mostly military, are reported to have conducted a campaign of violence, pulling individuals from their homes and resorting to torture, abductions, rape, and tear gassing. Examples of excesses include the arrest of journalist Leo Munhender, who was covering the story, and lawyer Doug Coltard, who was providing legal advice to activists, both charged with participation in a gathering with the intent to promote public violence. The abduction of medical doctor Peter Magombei from his home by three men after doctors had rejected the government concession of a pay increase also raised public alarm. In his case, a successful habeas corpus application was obtained, and I congratulate the lawyers who had that done. Most of those arrested were charged under Section 22 of the Criminal Code for allegedly subverting a constitutional government. But the arrests occurred during the visit to this country of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Freedom of Assembly and Association, Clément Nialetossi Voul, or Fool. He expressed concern over the use of this draconian law, attracting a penalty of 20 years against those exercising their constitutional right to peaceful assembly. He also reported disturbing levels of excessive, disproportionate, and lethal use of force, of abductions, arbitrary arrests, and torture by law enforcement and the army. There has been no investigation or prosecution of perpetrators, I understand. And hence, there has been no justice for the victims of these human rights violations. This failure follows earlier patterns of conduct by the authorities. So let me quote here uh, the Galema Matlanta Commission of Inquiry, set up by President Ngangwa to investigate the post-election violence of August 2018. Now, this is former President uh, Matlanta of South Africa, whom I work with closely. So he did that commission, and this was his recommendation. He recommended the arrest and prosecution of perpetrators alleged to have killed and injured protesters. But this recommendation was not implemented. So I come here to add a strong call to say urgently demilitarize law enforcement and restore constitutional powers and the rule of law and deliver victims for victims, deliver justice for victims by bringing perpetrators to account. Now I'm about to reach the end of my address. Time does not permit me to recount many other disturbing human rights violations such as the arrest and punishment of members of the LGBTI community and the perpetuation of the death penalty, even though there have been no executions since 2005, which means people are quite comfortable with no executions. President Manangwa was himself a former death row inmate and has stated publicly that he is against the death penalty. I reviewed his statement again. He said that the death penalty is a human rights violation. So in my current position as president of the International Commission Against the Death Penalty, while in Zimbabwe, I express my hope that Zimbabwe will at least vote in favor of the moratorium resolution that goes on in the UN General Assembly every year. There was just one year, two years ago, I believe, when Zimbabwe abstained. Last year, they voted against a moratorium. That resolution is not about abolition. We know that that's complex. However, moratorium, you already have a moratorium in this country since 2005. So I do hope that this time, uh, 
Zimbabwe will appear amongst those who vote in favor of a moratorium because it's such a human rights issue. Uh, one final I issue I felt cannot be overlooked, and that is internet shutdowns. <laughs> now, in 2016, the UN Human Rights Council declared access to the internet to be a human right. While some may question whether that properly you can equate the internet to essential rights such as water and right to life, it is nevertheless clear to all of us that people have a right to knowledge and communication in today's fast-moving electronic world. So shutting down the in internet and stifling social media is a human rights violation. Many right-wing leaders, not only here, many right-wing leaders have resorted to suppress dissent by suppressing social media communications. I've, I've not only checked this before, but even now. You know, how, you know, I spoke, I spoke out against Hungary for doing this, and and um, president, and when President Modi now shut down the internet in Kashmir, except good lawyers like you took it to court, and the Supreme Court of India outlawed the shutting down of the internet. Here in uh, Zimbabwe, in the wake of countrywide calls for peaceful strikes and protests over fuel price increases in January 2019, the government of Zimbabwe shut down the internet and people were denied access to the social media apps like Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp. The Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights and the Media Institute of Southern Africa challenged that directive in court and on 21st January 2019, High Court Judge Justice Owen Tagu ruled that the Minister of State in the President's office responsible for national security did not have the authority to issue any directives in terms of the Interception of Communications Act. But I think you still have a little bit more work to do to watch out for this not happening again by another minister acting under another law. <laughs> so on this uh, encouraging note of the successful action by Zimbabwe, Zimbabwean human rights lawyers that restored the human rights of millions of people, let me conclude by recalling that the very notion of human rights is under increasing attack all over the world. And now is the time for strong civil society activism. Steeped in ignorance and fear of the people they govern, many reactionary leaders are taking the lead from President Trump of the United States, who has no respect for the rule of law and global cooperation. His support for white supremacy in his goal to make America great again are serious threats to multilateralism and international human rights institutions built over half a century. The whole survival of inter human rights depends on cooperation across borders. Trump's rhetoric has been trumpeted by reactionary forces in Europe, where one opposition leader said, Europe is for whites only and everyone else should be kicked out. So that's what I mean by copycat statements. More and more governments are turning to increasingly inclusive technologies which systematically embed and exploit means of mass surveillance that threaten a whole range of fundamental human rights. These are all new areas to us. Those of us who studied law a long time do know very little about fake media, um, cyber crimes. You know, how, how do you get into that technology world and, and regulate them, and who should regulate them? The government or the um, Dominion servers like Facebook. So in many parts of the world, these assaults on human rights are being reinforced by attacks on the human rights movement itself. Hence, the restrictions on NGOs, the gagging of human rights defenders, and the shrinking of civil society space must receive our attention. Civil society, by, what, by which I mean not only lawyers, but all members of society 
all of us uh, have a crucial role to play in realizing human rights. Civil society provides a powerful stimulus for social change and justice. This is why an enabling and free environment for their activities is so essential for a country. Protecting and promoting the work of NGOs, of human rights defenders, of lawyers, journalists, artists, and communities themselves fighting for their civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights is a prerequisite for the development and prosperity of any society. Uh, so I, as, as I began by saying that in one year I find uh, the situation, if I had come to you in January last year, maybe I would have just praised all of you and gone back. But since the situation has deteriorated so much, I've come to urge you that all of us should uh, be, be now part of civil society activism. Thank you so much for your attention. Once again, uh, a round of applause for Justice Nabi Kalei. Wow. I think that was very, very detailed and very interesting. Uh, it was covering a whole wide spectrum of issues. Um, I think many of us will recall the internet shutdowns. You see, in Zimbabwe, you learn to be creative. After the internet was shut down, we were taught something called VPN. And uh, the definition of VPN, I don't know, but the one that was circulating on WhatsApp was Vrapaka <laughs> Varwanani. Yeah. So the trending word that week was VPN. So that's when I realized, okay, there's this uh, adequate technology. So I had asked uh, the vice chairman, I'm the chairman of the trust for whatever reason, but I had, my name is Mandivamba Rukuni. And I had asked our vice chair, Virginia Piri, who is more eloquent than I am, to actually come and talk. But she said, no. And so I have to do it. But she reminded me, just make it short, uh, which makes me have to tell you Walter Kamba's favorite story. Because as you heard from Justice Pillay, he was a graduate of Yale University. So his story was, that uh, at a commencement ceremony, the guest of honor was a, 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 a former Yale uh, graduate. So when he came, he got there and decided to use the four letters in, the, in Yale to make his speech. So he took Y out of Yale and spoke about youth at length, and then took the A and spoke about academia at length, and then took the L and spoke probably about love at length, and then took the E and spoke about excellence at length, at which point it, it said that uh, a loud whisper was heard from one professor at the head of the table there to the other to say, well, I'm relieved he didn't go to Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> 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 That was Walter Kamba. So, so let, let me start with some introductions because we have uh, two of us trustees today. And uh, Virginia Piri is a trustee. She just joined us last year as a trustee. A renowned, she's actually an outstanding accountant in her own right, but she's also an accomplished author. She's published several books. Thanks, Virginia. So we do have uh, apologies from all the other trustees. Uh, Professor Rangazi Nyemba, uh, Bohemian Mangama, who is a family friend. John Stewart, uh, who couldn't make it, but his wife, Kathy, over there, uh, his better three quarters decided to come in and do it. Ruth Dube, who is Angeline Kampa's sister, is in the UK at the moment. She couldn't make it. And then also Dr. Mabel Hungwe, who who is, in, who is away on, on a visit. So just by way of um, ex explaining then uh, 
uh, how some of us ended up being so close to Walter Kamba and Angeline. In my case, it, it was just a, f I, th I suppose it's fate that in 1986, I, I became, I be actually became the youngest dean in the university. I was only 33 years old, and everybody else was about my age now, or older. <laughs> so that, that and, and just because I was that much younger than everybody, I, I was therefore easily the best dean. I, I could, I, I had nothing else to do but to, <laughs> so, but then, true to African tradition, being the youngest, Walter Kamba also had to spend more time mentoring me. So, so I was always the guinea pig. And, and, and being a dean of agriculture, agriculture was always the first one to present. And so I always got all the corrections and, I, you know, because you couldn't do that to the other ones like, you know, Koton uh, Chavanduka or <laughs> Kahari. Because if, if he tried to do the same to uh, those guys, uh, I mean, like Kahari would say to Walter, I couldn't do that. So, so. So we, we, I became one of his protégés. So, and Virginia too was uh, a protégé of uh, Angeline Kamba. Those of you who know Angeline, you know she was quite a lady. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you actually, uh, she actually saved me from a fine one day uh, because she had told me how she, this, is, this is one for the lawyers. Because she, 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 she was parking a car, she says to me, at some shopping center, and the policeman actually walked. Remember those days when policemen were making money at every corner? So, so, so the policeman walked up to her and looked at a car and looked at the uh, radio license and then started asking her about the expired radio license. So she says, she then said to the policeman, are you trying to get money out of me? The policeman says, no, I'm just doing my job. She says, you're harassing me. And I'm going to effect a citizen's arrest on you. <laughs> the policeman didn't know what a citizen's arrest is. <laughs> so he had to back off and, and, and go. That was Angeline Kamba for you, you know. Uh, but Walter Kamba was quite something else. And listening to uh, Justice Pillay just reminded me of him so much. I mean. And you know, they, 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 I'll just tell you one of my favorite moments of mentorship from this man. Remember the time in 86, 87, when uh, st student riots became the thing of the day? Uh, and it's, it was, I mean, when you look at it today, it was obvious because we had the likes of Atham Tambara and Tendai Biti leading the students' union. So we had, we, students would go out on strike and Walter Kamba, his vice chancellor, would not allow lectures to go on until students were back in class. But in any case, as this was dragging on, we would have the Senate meet to decide, do, do we open, do we go back in class or we don't? So at this particular Senate meeting, it became quite heated. Uh, I mean, the vast majority of us agreed with Walter Kamba, we should not open until students are back in class because it doesn't serve any purpose because we would still have to reteach anyway when they eventually come back to class. Then one professor stood up and said, I don't agree with you people. I think we should open this university. At which point, two people sit in different spots, all shouted at this professor to say, Three, four letter words, I don't know what, you know. And, and, and that's the only time I saw Walter Kamba angry. You know, he literally stood up and banged the table and said, the two of you, you are going to, we're not proceeding with this meeting until the two of you stand up and apologize to this professor for trying to shut him up because you think he's in a minority. They had to apologize to the other proof professor before we could proceed. And from that day, the quality of conversation improved because people have to be heard, even if they're in the minority. After all, the majority are often wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I remember the, the time that I, 
as a Senate representative uh, in council, uh, I would attend some of the meetings with government. And it, actually, the same university closure story, Walter Kamba was eventually summoned by the Minister of Higher Education. Uh, it was Karim Anzira at the time. And he decided to ask uh, Ranga Ziemba, who was then registrar, and myself. Can't remember who else. We went to, because Karim Anzira never came to the university in times of crisis. You'd, you'd summon one to his office. So we got to his office. And the minister said to the vice chancellor, with all due respect, you, you, have to, you have to go back in class. You have to open the university. We are giving you an instruction as government. This is the position of cabinet. And Walter Kamba says to him, you know what? Anyway, he gave explanations why we should not open. But when the minister kept insisting, then Walter Kamba says to him, you know what? This is very simple. I am the vice chancellor of the university. And I run it at the best of my ability, and, uh, and my conscience guides me. You are the minister. You do your job as minister. I will run the university. And that was the end of the conversation. We stood up and walked out. You know, that was the caliber of the man. He was really something else. So I'm, I'm so humbled to stand here to represent him and his family. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's a great honor for me and the trustees uh, to the extent that um, when they, this event would not happen at its usual time last year, I, I was ready for it. And so were the trustees. I'm, I'm not complaining, I'm just explaining what happened. <laughs> I even bought a newer jacket than this one. <laughs> You know, Virginia and I went for lunch, and without, we, di we didn't even discuss this part, but I could tell it on your face and you could tell it on my face. Now, if this event ceases to happen, this is gonna be a disaster for the foundation. It's, it's the one thing that we still have, that we can still uphold and, 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 and honor this man. So we're so delighted was so delighted uh, that it, 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 came, it came to pass. And uh, in conclusion, I would say thank you so much to the Law Society of Zimbabwe for consistently holding this event. Thank you so much on behalf of the family and, and, and the trust. And uh, to Judge Pillay, uh, I'd just like to say such a pleasure lis listening to you. And, uh, and I'll tell you somebody else who agrees with you on the Wi-Fi, uh, because I've been to university campuses where if you can only get water at that site, and Wi-Fi is that site, <laughs> they'd rather go thirsty for hours <laughs> and go where the Wi-Fi is. That's how important. So it is indeed a human right. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much, and, uh, uh, and on behalf of the trustees and the family, Asante Sana, which is something you say when you're about to go. The awards. Mr. President, over to you. For the Walter Kamba Rule of Law Award, our award tonight is a man who has worked tirelessly as a legal practitioner, firstly in, the, uh, in government, and for a long time he has uh, had a passion for teaching, and he is currently a, a lecturer. He has written on the subject of the law in many publications, very unassuming. The reason why all of you are still wondering who this may be is because he's a humble man and he never uh, produces for, for purposes of uh, uh, getting any recognition. But 
for the sake of uh, uh, contribution. He has uh, he played a crucial role in the crafting of the 2013 uh, uh, constitution. He has consistently followed the implementation of the constitution. He has tirelessly commented on the bills and most of us as legal practitioners for the current information and the status of the law, we rely on his writings. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our 2019 Award D, Brian Crozier. I am certain that uh, he is not here tonight, but there is a, a fellow lecturer. May I ask you, Professor Julie Stewart, to please come and receive the award. If I may have it, yes. I, I did indicate at the beginning that we do have two awards. The second one, uh, there is a there is quite some 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 competition. We are looking at the young human rights lawyer of the year. This is a, an award that is given to the young lawyer who would have performed. Uh, impressively during uh, a particular year and this award relates to 2019. I did indicate previously that uh, we had, uh, during the year 2019, we had uh, uh, fast track trials where particularly most of our, our young lawyers committed themselves, committed their time, at times hanging uh, uh, at a time more than uh, one meter and uh, having difficulties in judging those. And sometimes they would do this work for free. Uh, so this particular young lawyer distinguished himself in the field of uh, uh, representing uh, particularly uh, uh, people who were indigent. I did indicate that there were several people that were caught in the dragnet arrest, some of whom were certainly not involved, but he shined in representing uh, these particular individuals. Um, because obviously we have so many of these young lawyers who excelled, I know that it would be extremely difficult for anyone to even uh, uh, attempt a case, but we are grateful, ladies and gentlemen, to Paida Moyo Brian Saurombe. applause for our young human rights lawyer award. It's quite a great honor to, to receive an award when you're young. And by the time you get to Zana, I, I think you, you'll be having several of these. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's been promised that it's going to be a dinner. So it's not dinner without food. So we are going to 